I want to go a little more slowly over the things that we did that I did yesterday. I think I left half the at least half the class behind, if not more. And I asked you to do a homework problem uh, about analyzing the entry deterrence game as a simultaneous game. Uh, so we're going to step through that a little more slowly than I whipped through the uh, um, the game for the Reserve Bank against the, the uh, fiscal authorities yesterday. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this idea of an information set. Uh, we'll use an example of a card game, and I'll, get, and I'll get you to do a little kind of exercise, a kind of thing, again, that I, I would like to be able to ask you to do an exam, but we get some practice to do these in the, in the class, okay? So those are the only two things we're going to try today. I, um, I tidied up the, the website a little bit. Uh, and changed around uh, week five and week six. If you go into the website for week five, you'll find a reading on that minimum effort coordination game. Uh, I took the game from uh, the actual sample of the game from Charlie Holt's book on markets, games, and strategies. It's, uh, there's about four pages there on that game if you want to have a look at um, uh, how it was designed. Uh, and how you could tweak it a little bit, and it explains some interesting strategies uh, kind of in the game. And I've also put up a little video clip on g going through that minimum effort game. Um, this week, I had planned to do a little bit more on uncertainty than I'm actually going to be able to reach. So instead of you know, listing all these things and not getting to them, let's just try and sort of close off this term with uh, trying to understand the relationship between simultaneous and sequential games, the idea of Nash equilibria. And we'll, we'll uh, introduce the idea of uncertainty, but we won't, really won't get to that until we come back in, uh, in week seven, and then we'll start to look at some interesting ideas about probability, uncertainty, and inferences in strategic situations, OK? So again, go, you know, to the website, just kind of go there during the break keep up with uh, a little bit of the reading. We'll be doing some material from Chapter 7, but a lot of that first week back will just be new concepts about uh, reasoning and uncertainty. There is a handout by Gerd Gigerenzer called Calc uh, from his book called Calculated Risk, which is uh, up there for you to look at. And I think you'll find that one of the most interesting things that uh, you'll read in this course, much less at university. His book is an excellent book on how we make mistakes about reasoning under uncertainty, not just we, but all kinds of professionals. It's kind of geared towards uh, uh, medical things, doctors, diagnostic tests, the kind of inferences that people take out of this, their uh, health risks and the sort of actions they take, when, partly because they don't really understand uncertainty. Things about AIDS, about uh, you know, mad cow disease, uh, 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 child abuse, wife beating, it's just like everything in, in there. How do, you, how do you, racial discrimination, how do you make sense out of uncertainty? How do you make inferences? How do you communicate risk pretty well? A fascinating book. And I've just got a little excerpt for you to have a look there. Anyhow, so let's go to the material today. I've given you a handout, which were, has two game trees on it and, and a, two payoff matrices. We're going we're gonna to build up the right-hand side payoff matrix, just like we did yesterday, uh, and then we're going to analyze it. So let's separate out those two things. Okay, First, representing a sequential game as a simultaneous game, and then analyzing uh, a sequential game as a simultaneous game. We're going to see there's multiple equilibria. I want to try and understand what these multiple e equilibria are because it's the first little chink in the armor of the Nash equilibrium concept. Maybe there isn't something so sensible about this idea. Okay? Now, just to take a little step back, I said at the beginning of the course there's this acronym PDIP we could use to look at strategic uh, uh, situations or situations where there's uh, uh, strategic interaction, interaction between rational intelligent players. And so what we do is we sort of think of, okay, who are the players? What can they do? What's their information? And what are their incentives or payoffs in the game? So that's uh, the basic structure. And then we work through uh, several kinds of stylized little games. But we came up with this idea of Nash equilibrium, okay? And essentially, the Nash equilibrium idea says any game, any situation of strategic interaction, basically there will be players and what they can do and what their information is and what their payoffs are. But what we want to predict is their strategies. 
Okay? And their strategies are complete specifications of what to do in all the circumstances they find themselves in. And we, we found we could do that for simultaneous games and for sequential games. Okay? And so the idea is essentially what people can do is their strategies. Now, a strategy is a complete specification. So in a game, there'd be a lot of things that happen that you won't actually see happen. It could happen that we won't see happen. And a strategy specifies all of those logical possibilities. And we came up with a Nash equilibrium idea that says, well, strategies are whatever they are in a game. But basically, to make sense out of a game, you've got to know what your opponent's strategies are. And as you figure out what their opponent's strategies are, you figure out, well, what are the different strategies I could uh, use to counter what his strategies are and what are my payoffs going to be? And if you make a best response to what you think your opponent's strategy is going to be, and if they're sitting over there making a best response to what they think your strategy is going to be, and what you think their strategy is going to be turns out to be what their best response is, and vice versa, <clears throat> the mutual best response, that's what the Nash equilibrium is. Okay? So we've got this sort of general idea. This is what game theory predicts will happen. You look for this kind of this Nash equilibrium concept, which is intelligent people reasoning about other people's beliefs, beliefs and actions and payoffs and stuff like that, and coming up with some strategies which are best responses to one another. Okay. So that's like the general idea. And, and we, we look through uh, a couple of those examples by Kreps, uh, the other one about playing it safe, where you, you basically at the end of the day there's other things people could do, but if they're not Nash equilibria, they don't make sense. Well, now we're going to look at a, at a situation where there's some Nash equilibria that also don't seem to make sense. And that's, what, that's one of the things that popped out of looking at a sequential game as a simultaneous game. So let's, let's go back and have a, a look at this little description of the entry deterrence game. Get my whole list of little ideas here. Now, we started off with the entry deterrence game with the, this is from you know, the first couple of weeks where the red player invests uh, or not invests, the blue player decides to enter or not enter. If it observes, the red player invests, enter or not enter. If it, Serious or they are not invest, and these are the patterns of payoffs. And we worked out various kinds of uh, counting strategies that we made you do in the exam. So we said there were two strategies for the red player, and there's four strategies for the because there's two things they can do up at this node and two things they can do at that node. The nodes describe the situations they find themselves in, and we have four possible strategies. You can enter always. Not enter always, or they can do some mixture: enter and not enter, or not enter and enter. And down here, I just wrote those four strategies along the top row of a payoff matrix. And what we're kind of thinking of doing this is thinking: well, once you've got the strategy specified, really you don't even need the player to play the game. You could sort of, you know, give it to your mother or give it to a lawyer or someone who could faithfully implement the strategy. And then a question would be: well, what strategy would you choose? Okay. And the other player's got their strategies, and what strategies would they choose? And imagine that being a simultaneous game, that you know, the blue player is going to choose their strategies, which will depend, in the, in the actual game, they will be able to see what the other player's done, but they're going to choose these strategies without knowing exactly what it is the other player will do. Okay. I mean, they might be able to reason through what those things are, but the idea is they, they won't be able to directly observe them in the simultaneous game, but implicit in the strategies is that they can observe in the sequential game. Okay, so what we're going to do is just say, well, here's four strategies. Imagine that strategy has to be specified before the beginning of this game. And imagine that uh, the red player has to specify their strategy before the beginning of this game. And then we'll take the strategies and we'll play them out and see what happens. So what we're going to do is play all these eight logical possibilities out and see what happens. Just to be clear, this strategy list, always enter, corresponds to those two choices in the, that sequential game. This strategy, enter and not enter, corresponds to these two choices in the sequential game. So enter and not enter. Okay. So each component of the strategy list tells you what you'll do at node B1 and then at node B2. Now, let's go along the top row. So we're going to imagine that the red player invests. Okay. So we're going to try and fill in these payoffs here. Let's look at that first pair of strategies, enter or not enter. Basically, all we've done is we've taken this payoff and mapped it down into that cell. Why are we doing that? Well, what we're thinking is the strategy for the blue players is always enter. So if they always enter, they're going to enter in particular when the red player invests, they get to node B1, they'll enter, they'll get that payoff, 
put it down here. And notice, it doesn't really matter what they do down here at node B2, because if the red player invests, they're going to end up at node B1. That's why, in the second cell down here, we also get one and one, because this strategy is enter at node B1 and don't enter at, no at node B2. So if the red player invests, we're going to end up at B1. The strategy of the blue player that's relevant for that contingency is to enter. It would take the B1 up here, map it down to that cell down there. Okay. Let's take the third set of strategies for the blue player. Not enter at B1, enter at B2. Okay. What's going to happen there? Well, because the red player is invested, the relevant part of the strategy Blue players to not enter, that's going to lead to a payoff of three and three. So we, we match those two strategies up, put that down here. It's three and three. And similarly for the last. For the last. Uh, sorry, I'll this. For the last um, pair of strategies or strategy for the blue player, which is never enter. They never enter played again, never enter on both B1 and B2 played against invest is going to lead to payoffs three and three. So we take these payoffs here, map them down into that cell down. Now, that fills out the top row of the payoff. What's the second row going to look like? Well, the second row is going to take, uh, let's just do it so I don't. Imagine the, blue, the red player plays not invest. So we're moving out this branch down here against enter and enter. Okay, enter and enter. We take this number here, two and four, and map it down into that cell there. If we play against enter and not enter, then it's going to be enter up here, not enter down here. We take this number four and two, and it goes mapped down to this cell down here. If we take the strategy not enter and enter, then we're doing not enter and enter. So we take this payoff, map it down into that cell down there. And that's how we get the right-hand side matrix, OK? So let me just put in the uh, bottom row of payoffs. And let's just summarize here. This game is a sequential game, okay? And this is the way we represent it by the game tree. But the same game, and since it's the same players, it's the, they have the same actions, they have the same information, and they have the same payoffs, can be represented by this in this simultaneous way. Now, it's not a simultaneous game because one of the players can observe what the other player does. But this larger game can be analyzed as if it were a simultaneous game. Okay, you say, well, the theorists do these sort of things. They're saying, well, you know, it's like, it's like a prism. You sort of, well, I'm looking at it one way. What if I looked at it the other way? You know, I've done all this, we've all done this Nash equilibrium idea with the, with the simultaneous games. We've got a sequential game. Really, you could look at it as a sequential game as specifying strategies in a simultaneous game. It's just that they're very complete strategies. So let's just look at it and see what happens. And that, we got some very interesting results when we see what happens. Okay, that's what we're going to do with the analysis. Now, the first thing that we do with this analysis is we, we work out the best responses of, of the players. Okay? So if we're looking at the red player's best response, two is better than one, so we put a little knot. Four is better than one, so we put a little knot. Three is better than two, so we put a little knot. Four is better than three, so we put a little knot there. Okay? And then we, for the blue player, given the red player does uh, invest, we're looking at the blue payoffs across this row, and the threes are both better than the ones, and they're, they're both... Uh, best, the strategies in these columns are both best responses. I mean, there's two best responses, but that's okay. Um, we know these other guys aren't best responses. And similarly, down here, four and a four are the cells where there are best responses. Okay. So we're just analyzing this game as it was a, a simultaneous game. And what do we come up with? Two Nash equilibria. It, this is, so it's a multiple equilibria kind of game. And you're sort of thinking, hey, I, we thought we analyzed this one way, and we came up with one equilibria. Now we're analyzing it another way, and we come up with two equilibria. What's the relationship between the two? And that's the fundamental question that people were asking is, what's the relationship between this rollback reasoning, the look forward, think ahead idea, 
uh, sorry, look forward, think back, you know, reason backwards. Um, and the idea of the Nash equilibria, which says, okay, tell me, a, tell me a strategy, I'll make a best response to it. If my strategy, uh, my best response is something you're thinking of, and you're making the best response to it, and that's what I was thinking of, and we're both thinking of these things, that's a Nash equilibrium. How does that relate to the rollback equilibrium? Okay, so this is the question we're going to answer. Well, let's look at that rollback equilibrium. The rollback equilibrium in this game, as we figure you guys can work this, this out again, that the red player is going to invest, the blue player is uh, going to not enter, and we're going to have these payoffs. Now, those payoffs 3 and 3 cores correspond to these payoffs 3 and 3 here in the simultaneous game representation. Because the strategy in the rollback, the rollback is to not enter at V1 and to enter at V2. That's the strategy for the blue player. The strategy for the red player is to invest when he gets this opportunity to move. And that's what this, these pair of strategies do. They pick out this particular Nash equilibria. That Nash equilibria corresponds to the rollback equilibria. However, there's another Nash equilibria. And that's this one down here. Now, what's this Nash equilibria down here? Okay. Here's a Nash equilibria where the blue player always enters and the red player doesn't invest. Okay, and you say, well, what's a Nash equilibria? Well, Nash equilibria is a set of mutual best responses. Okay, so if we expect this, I mean, we got the problem of you want multiple equilibria, which one are you going to choose? But if they were selecting or focusing on this one here, it, it would use the reasoning, Nash reasoning, we'd say, well, if the blue player expects the red player to not invest, then this always entering is a best response. And if the red player expects the blue player to always enter, then not investing is the best response. So that is a set of mutual best responses. It is a Nash equilibrium. According to that logic of Nash equilibrium, it's a pretty reasonable thing to expect. Given you know, what you expect the other guy to do, you're making the best response. And the action that's your best response is what the other guy is expecting you to do. And he's making the best response, which was the thing that you were expecting to do in the first place to get your best response. Okay? That's the circular reasoning that the Sicilian and the Wesley guy do. And the thing is like, goes around in a circle. But it, it's consistent. It's got that logic in it. So looking, let's, look at this, let's look at this equilibrium a little deeper. And the way we're going to look at it a little deeper is to use the concept of a subgame. Okay? Now there's two subgames in this particular game. One, the subgame starting from this node. And the other, the subgame starting from node B1. Now the idea of using subgames, again, is a way of thinking about more complex situations. Uh, you know, when you play chess, when you play bridge, when you're, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of a competitive football match or you're in a, uh, you know, strategic situation in a, in a work kind of thing, it's really usually very complex. And so often you just break it down into little pieces that you can try to analyze. And that's really what a subgame does, okay? So in this simple game, there's only two subgames. And if we look what's happening in the subgame that we expect to get to, that is where the red player doesn't invest and the blue player invests, then in that subgame, the blue player is doing the rational thing. They're choosing enter or we're not enter. Four is bigger than two. Okay? But in the subgame associated with B1, that is, if the red player had invested, then the blue player is entering when he's only getting a payoff of one. And if he had not entered, he would have got a payoff of three. Okay. So in this subgame, the blue player is doing something that goes against his best interest. And if you like, we're not, in the, with the course of play in this, uh, in this equilibrium, we're never going to get to node B1. Okay? But the, the strategies that the people are believing in embody this notion that if we did get to B1, the other guy would do something against his best interests. And why would he do that? Well, one thing is if you're sitting there and there's two Nash equilibria, remember we had the focal point thing, and you're sort of thinking, well, okay, I, I'm, I'm red player and getting three, I'm the blue player and getting three in that one. If we get over this equilibrium from the blue player's standpoint, that would be better for him, right? Because four is a higher number. It's a more preferred equilibrium for him. There's a bit of a conflict of interest between these two guys, uh, the two players in that uh, in those equilibrium. Kind of like the battle of sexes in that respect, there's a conflict of interest in the, in the equilibria. And so you'd think, well, in the strategy where I always enter, 
The blue player isn't communicating with the red player. But in the strategy, the strategy says, ah, if I, the red player, the red player invests, and we get to know B1, then I am going to enter. I'm going to do something irrational. And that's going to punish you, red player. You're going to go from a three to a one. And you can think of that as a threat. Okay? Now, it's not actually an explicit threat like uh, in, in language or communication, but it's embodied in the strategy. It's a strategy that says, OK, if we get up here to know uh, B1, I'm not doing the thing in my best interest. I'm going to go out and punish you. Okay. Now, that's a different kind of reasoning than best response reasoning, because best response reasoning says, you know, when I go to look at a situation, I'm looking at it from my perspective. I'm making my best response. I'm not making the response that's out to punch you. That's what this threat would be. Okay. And, but we call it a non-credible threat because if the blue player ever did get out to know B1, uh, it's true, you could threaten that. I mean, and in this, you know, if people believe in, that, in this strategy, always entering, then there's a, there's a threat that says, you know, I'm going to act against my own best interest. But that is it. You're acting against your own best interest. It's not believable that you would act against your own best interest if we got to that portion of the game. Now, it's believable that you would say that you're acting against your, your best interest because we know you as a blue player would like to go from this equilibrium to that equilibrium. Okay. We're not going to talk about uh, yet until we get to chapter 10 about manipulating games with several equilibria to try to get your more preferred equilibria. And that's where threats and promises and contracts and all kinds of things come in. It's a, there's a fascinating discussion in chapter 10 on this, the ways in which people can manipulate games in their own favor. Or if you're designing some kind of strategic interaction, you might want to design it so that you can get good outcomes for everybody. Okay? What, what, at, at the moment, just want you to be able to read this read this strategy always entering as implicitly containing a threat but it's not a believable threat and it's not a credible threat and there's a, a, a the idea of credible threats is a language that starts to pop up uh, and now a lot in, in game theory because um, you know you ask the question okay if you're saying you're always going to enter and I look at always, well, that's some circumstances. I go to some circumstances and I, I look at it and say, it's really not in your interest to, to enter. Then your statement or your strategy statement uh, isn't believable. Okay? It isn't believable because I can't really believe that you go against your own self-interest. If I knew what that interest is, if I don't know what that interest is, fine. Okay? And for example, politicians are always in this problem. Okay? They, they have a, um, they're always making promises. And, you know, should you believe a politician's promise? Well, you almost, you know, just ask the question. You say, no, of course not. You know, it's like the salesman. You know, this is the best car in the lot. Fantastic brakes, you know, and fantastic tires. Don't look at the tires. Don't kick the side. You know, don't try anything here. But it's like these sort of claims. You think, I don't believe these guys. Why? Because you expect them to act in their own interests. Okay? And if they say they're going to act against their interests, you know, like they're, they're offering you the best car, the best deal, or the... You know, um, you know, superannuation payments forever with no taxes, it's that kind of stuff. It's like, it's just not believable. So that's the idea of uh, this Nash equilibrium here contains these non-credible threats. Now, to distinguish between these two kind of equilibrium, there's a new concept for, uh, it comes out of Nash equilibria. Some Nash equilibria are called perfect, and those are called subgame perfect. So we use the acronym SPE. And Again, it's just a bunch of jargon from game theory, but it's an important concept, okay? Because it's a way of believing things about what other people are going to do that when they get in these circumstances, it'll be in their interest to follow through on the things that are, they're expecting you to believe that they're going to do. Whereas the other Nash equilibrium, it's imperfect. It doesn't have that property, okay? There are, if you believed it, you'd be believing that people at some circumstances in the strategic situations, even if we don't actually get to them, but if we did get to them, they would be acting against their own best interests. So we call that a, um, a well, it, it's imperfect, but that language is used for other things, so we say it's not subgame perfect. So it's a not SPE equilibrium. Now, the, the labeling isn't really that crucial. You know, it's, it's nice to know that uh, on an exam, like if you see something like this and I ask you the question, you know, uh, please identify the subgame perfect equilibrium you know what I'm asking for. It's just a, a, a label. But if you were to try to explain it to your friends, you'd say, well, okay, the Nash equilibrium is a cool concept. Okay? It's, it's kind of a way of thinking about what people might believe in complex situations. But, you know, it has this little flaw that it may be that embodied in those beliefs are a bunch of things that you're expecting about other people where they wouldn't be in their interest to carry through 
uh, on their actions when they get to situations where they have to carry through their actions according to what you're actually believing. So that's that's why we bring this idea of subgame perfection in. And it, once people discovered this in game theory, it opened up a whole new way of kind of thinking about Nash equilibria because we had this multiple equilibria problem. You know, remember in the battle of the sexes or the coordination games or, you know, you might think, well, if, if you're all coordinated on the better equilibria, just a little bit of communication is going to get you somewhere and we'll all get to the better equilibria, right? Um, but when there, are, when there are multiple equilibria and there's conflict of interest, uh, what are you going to do? How are you going to work this out? Well, one of the things you could do is, is <clears throat> it may be that in the uh, Nash equilibrium you have that are representing some strategic action situation, the strategies embody people doing things which would be against their interest to do if they get in the situations they're in. You say, oh, no, I don't, we don't want to believe equilibrium like that. It doesn't make sense. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah, I know it's, it's a complex one, but... Uh, we will, as long as you can kind of read, the two things you need to be able to do. One is to take the sequential game with the payoffs, map it into a simultaneous game that represents it, and then analyze that game, distinguish between the, Nash the various kinds of Nash equilibria. Sometimes you get multiple ones, sometimes you only get a single one, but the idea is you kind of, you're, 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 when you're looking at it a different way from this other side, it could be that you will identify Nash equilibria that are, uh, not subgame perfect. Okay. Okay. Now the next thing we did yes, uh, the thing we did yesterday was um, uh, introduce the concept of an information set. See a blank screen. So what I'm going to do is uh, please don't write this down because I actually have a handout for you with this written on it. Okay. Um, uh, what I want you to do is take up a pen and pencil, presumably, or two colored pens and try to take this text and see if you can draw a game tree okay, from this basic text. Now, um, this is a game with, uh, with some cards. Now, it, I was going to bring a whole deck of cards, but I thought maybe I'd get in trouble with your parents or something for gambling at the... And uh, I remember one year when I was doing Econ 204, I was doing this stuff in sports betting, and I, I wanted to give the students an endowment of money so they could bet in the TAB, you know, but I didn't think that parents would like that. And the rest of the university didn't think they'd like that either, so I never really did it. Um, well, we're not really going to gamble, but uh, the idea is that um, you have a deck of cards. Okay, now half these cards are um, spades and half are clubs. There's only four. Okay, I could have brought 26, but we only got four. Okay, And so at the beginning of the game, I'm going to... Um, I got keys. Can't have my car. Okay, so I have a bunch of money here. Okay, let's take these are ten cent pieces, but let's take them as dollars. So, at the beginning of the game, there's two players. There's a red player and a blue player. Okay, so Megan, you can be a red player, and I'll be a, I'll be a blue player. And we're sitting here. I have more money than she has, so I'm going to bet more and squeeze her out of the game. Okay. Um, and uh, we each put a dollar in the pot. So we're, we're saying, okay, we're, we're going to play this game. So we throw, a, we put a dollar in, okay? And then uh, the red player draws a card from the shuffle deck. But you don't show me the card, okay? So you, you take a card. The rest of you can see your card. You can hold it up so they can see it back of there. Now, part of this game that makes it kind of interesting is that Megan can see the card and I can't see the card, okay? So this is going to be a game where there's an aspect of private information. Okay? And there's some uncertainty going on here is that there are four cards. I don't know which one that she drew. Right? So uh, she draws her card uh, from the shuffle deck. And uh, of course, I could look at the rest of the cards and figure out which one she took, but I wouldn't do that. Okay, I'll just put them in just to make sure that I don't. So Ray looks at her card privately and decides whether to raise or to fold. So she has two actions. If, she, if red folds, then she shows the card to blue and the game ends. So supposing, supposing you were to fold, can you show me the card? Just, just, just imagine it happening. What is it? It's a spade. Okay. Um, it says, uh, uh, red takes the card and the money if the, if the card is a club, but blue takes the money in the pot if the card is a spade. So I'm blue. I take the money because it's a spade. Okay. So then we, we keep going down. If, um, uh, if red were to raise, 
then she adds another dollar to the pot, and blue must decide whether to meet or pass. If blue passes, then the game ends and red takes the money in the pot. However, if blue meets, then he must also add another dollar to the pot, and then red shows the card to blue, and the game ends. In this case, again, red takes the money in the pot of the card as a club, and blue takes the money in the pot of the card as a spade. Okay, pens and pencils out. Little, see if you can sketch, see if you can kind of trace that down and draw the little game tree that would be associated with that, okay? Just take a few minutes. I actually have the text and my suggestion for how to draw the game tree for you, but I'd like you to try that. Now, one thing you could do in this game is you can think of Another player in this game. It's going to be nature. Okay, we'll call it, it's just a terminology and from game theory. Uh, nature is the method for drawing the card. Okay, and nature can choose either a club or a spade. And nature moves first in this game. Okay, so you might put nature in black and then put the red and then put the blue. Okay, so the hint is that nature is the first mover in this game, and then uh, it's up to you to try and figure out how would you draw. A game tree. Don't worry about analyzing the game. Just try and get the structure of the branches, and then we'll try to work out what the payoffs are uh, at the end. If you can, it, if you can plot the payoffs in, all the better. Again, don't worry about writing it down. I have it on a sheet for you in a, in a second. Any idea where to That's a bit. What's, where's the nature going to be? Nature moves first. A little black dot over there. Okay, so nature could choose. What's nature's choices? Club, a club or a spade. Okay. So, so that would be like you find if you you know if you go see nature, spade, and then. Gets to observe what nature does, according to the, to, to the text. There it says red looks at her card privately. Okay, decides whether to raise or fold. So nature moves. So what, what do you want to put on that branch there? Just oh, no. <coughs> could be the one connect. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Let's try it. Just put a spade and see how it works out. Okay, so then red gets to observe that, right? Yeah. And what are her actions here? She can raise or fold. Uh, I'm going to hand these out here, and well, I'll go through the way in which I was looking at this problem when I, when I was doing this morning. Looks like an I'll take that one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it is hard. It's 
stuff sort of all the way down and then sketch it, okay? Yeah. Okay, it's, um, it is difficult to take some text and turn it into a game tree, okay? So if you, it, there's a little art that eventually comes to it, and one good thing is to have the text beside you, and you're just kind of just tracing through as you work your way down to figure out uh, what's going on, okay? Now, let me, um, let me show you how I, I set up this, uh, this game tree and, and why, okay? Remember, the, the d description of the text, or the hint, was that nature, there's a third player in here. And the way we're going to represent uh, uh, uncertainty is that um, each of the players knows the deck of cards thing is happening. And so we can represent the choice of the deck of cards, or the choice of the card that comes out of the deck, uh, or the selection, as a choice of some player. But the player doesn't have any payoffs. It's just, okay, uh, uh, the black node is nature could, on the top, can choose a club, or she can choose a spade, okay? Why am I saying nature is a she? It's like calling a boat she a feminine thing. I don't know, it must be, maybe it's French originally, who knows? Okay. All these ginger stuff. So we have nature choosing a club or a spade. So then the idea is that uh, the red player gets to observe. This diagram isn't finished, by the way, but the one you have is. Um, the, um, uh, the red player gets to observe whether... It's a club or whether it's a spade. And then there's two courses of action. You can either fold or raise. Fold or raise. Now, according to the text, she looks at the card privately. If red folds, then she shows the card to blue and the game ends. So a fold brings an end to the game. Okay, so that's why there's... I'm putting a little black dot here. I think I used little gray squares before as the end, the, the end of the game happens and the payouts occur. Now, I, what I did is I made the payouts be kind of relative to um, the, the net gain that the person would, the, the people would make. Okay? You might have uh, said, well, you got the total coins, but you know, she put in one and then she got back two, so that's a net of one. So we got a, a red one, a gain for the uh, red player if it's a club, and a loss of one for the blue player if... Uh, it's a club. On the other hand, if it had been a spade, it would have been the other way around. The blue player would have got the money in the pot and so gone up one, and the red player would have been down one. Jason, are you happy with that? So that's just as she folds. So the idea is, okay, the fold is the simple part. Let's see what happens if she raises. Okay, now, the idea with a, with a raise is then it turns the game over to the blue player. Now the blue player can either meet that raise by, uh, um, uh, sorry, when there's a raise, the, um, the red player's uh, inviting the blue player to stay in the game and putting another dollar in the pot, okay? The blue player gets to either meet that by putting another dollar in the pot or fold, okay? So at each of these nodes, they can meet um, or, or pass, okay, fold. And supposing that... Uh, Blue player passes. Okay. Then what we said is that so you don't put any more money in the pot. Then you get the same outcomes as we had before. If it's a club, one and minus one, one and minus one. If it's a spade, and uh, red player is raised, uh, and blue player passes, it's the. Uh, did I get that right? <laughs> So this one, this one must be reversed around. Better change that. I mean, looking at the last sentence, it says, um, in this case again, red takes the money in the pot if the card is a club, and blue takes the money in the pot if the if the card is a spade. Okay, so we better change that one around. Look at my other, my other templates. I didn't, I didn't think I had a mistake in that one. Okay, so we've got the, um, we've got what happens if the, if the blue player passes. But suppose the blue player meets. Okay, if the blue player meets, then no, 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 no. Okay, sorry, I'm right. I was right in the first place. 
It's good. I'm halfway down the paragraph. If red races, then she adds another dollar to the pot, and blue must decide whether to meet or pass. Um, if blue passes, then game ends, and red takes the money in the pot. Okay. Which is uh, so that if blue passes, we've, she's taking one. Uh, red's going up by one, and the blue player's going down. However, if blue decides to meet, that's when the contingency comes in. If it's a club, then blue's going to have to pay out. Is going to lose the uh, two. But if it's a spade. Then he's going to go up two, and the red player is going to go down minus two. Got confused by my own reasoning. Okay. So, so far, this is the pattern of play that uh, we would expect, uh, or not the pattern. This is the diagram we would expect. But this diagram isn't quite right because what it, if you look at what it is that the blue player knows at the stage when they are going to make their choice, is the blue player here at B1 can see that the red player is made a raise, but they can also see that the Black player has chosen a club. Okay. I mean, the nature moves a club. The blue player raises at node B1. What's node B1? Well, that's the sequence where we get raise a club. Um, nature chooses a club as a raise, and I get to choose as a blue player to meet or to pass. Okay. This node here, B2, where does it sit? Well, it sits at the, at the end of this path of play. Spades here, raise. So I'm the blue player. I can observe everything that's gone before in the game. Okay, so that isn't quite right, and that's where that's where we bring in the idea of an information set. Yes. If the blue player meets, the card is a spade. Uh, well. The, the, no, the red player loses with a spade. The blue player loses with a with a. I mean, the, the red red player loses with a spade, so the blue player gains. The red player wins with a club. Let's go back to the base, the first one, okay? Club, fold, red player wins. Spade, fold, red player loses. Okay. Club, raise, meet. The Red player wins just as they want it. They win with a club. Red player wins with a club, and the red player loses with a spade. Or the blue player. In these cases, it's zero, a zero-sum game because the numbers are always going to add up to zero. Okay, but the or the payoffs do. But the blue player is winning here. The blue player wins with a spade if she meets the raise of the red player. Then you better that. Okay, so let's put in this, this idea of the information set. The information set is that it sort of joins these two nodes together. Okay, and uh, the way in which we represent the information for the blue player in this game is to say, look at the blue player can't really tell whether they're, they, they get a chance to move, but they can't tell whether that node B1, which is associated with the club, or at node B2, which is associated with the spade. They can tell that the blue player has raised. But they still don't know what the uh, card is that the red player has. Whereas there's no information set around the red player's node, so the red player knows this. Red player knows which card that she has when she makes her decision to raise or fold. But the blue player, when they make their decision to pass, doesn't know the things that the red player knows. In particular, can't observe or can't distinguish between this path of play and that path of play. So the information set loops together or bundles together, if you like, nodes which are the end of paths of play that can't be distinguished by the blue player. So that's its idea. It's a way of representing things that one player knows or doesn't know. So we look at this game, and now when you look at a, at a sequential game, you look for. We're going to also going to look for information sets, and in this case, there are information sets for the blue player, and that says, oh, the blue player can't distinguish between this path of play. That path of play. Whereas the red player can tell what went on before when she makes her move, club or a spade. Idea? So, okay, good, good idea. The, I mean, using the, the theory to try and figure out how is the blue player going to. Uh, uh, um, going to play this game. I mean, the idea for the red player, I mean, if you've got a club, you can guarantee yourself a one by folding. But if you raise, then uh, maybe the other guy's going to meet you and you'll get two. Okay. So the, the, so the red player, if they've got a club, 
if you know they might want to say okay I could fold or I could raise okay but supposing they get a spade they could fold and lose one but they could also raise and can kind of hope the other guy passes because okay? if the other guy passes when they raise then you'll get a one as well so you could bluff so that's the this brings in this uh, this idea that what is the blue player sitting there thinking what is the what's the red player going to do do they, you know if they if they raise if they had a club like it makes sense for them to raise but if they had a spade makes sense for them to raise if they think that I might pass because they're bluffing. Are they bluffing? How do I figure that out? Okay. Now, before we get into, I mean, ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to boil this down to a little uh, two by four uh, payoff matrix. Okay. But to get there, we want to describe the payoffs. Now, the, it turns out that it's, it's quite in, uh, in, intriguing to think about the payoffs to the red player. I just want to add one more element to this game. And that is the, um, uh, this idea of the uncertainty about a club or a spade. Now, when I've got a deck you know, with half clubs and half spades and it's well shuffled and we're not, nobody's cheating out of this, you're probably going to think it's 50, the probabilities are 50-50, okay? But just generally, we'd like to know what the, what the probabilities are uh, for nature to choose things. Okay. Now, one of the intri interesting aspects is that, you know, like I was... Um, uh, uh, with Megan, I was giving her this deck here like, like this, but, and, and it, we both knew that it was a 50-50 deck, okay? But one, another thing that could happen is that, um, you know, I put in a red card in this deck. And I, I know the composition of the deck, but Megan doesn't know. She doesn't, we have differences in probabilities. But in this game, and those are going to be those games of uh, uh, imperfect but asymmetric information. I think it was question three out of the six. Okay, just have a look now at the, at the next idea, which is... Um, the payoffs for the blue player. I, I, I kind of grade these out because I want to focus in on the payoffs of the blue player. The blue player has to make a choice up here. They don't get to choose at B1 or at B2 because they don't see B1 and T, B2. All they know is they got to make a choice. So they have to meet or they have to pass. So their payoff is going to depend. It's going to be contingent. This is a new word, okay? Keep this idea. It's a contingent payoff. It's a payoff that depends on something. It's going to depend on the card, the play of the cards. It's either minus two or it's plus two. If blue pass, if, if the blue player p passes, they're, uh, um, at this point, they're, <laughs> they're going to get minus one for sure. Okay. Now, what you can think of is that minus one for sure is also a contingent payoff, but it's the same loss no matter whether you've got a club or a spade. And um, I'm going to introduce that idea kind of up here is that when we're thinking of payoffs now, with uncertainty, you don't know what payoff you're going to get, okay? And that's what makes games, well, partly fun, if you like a little bit of risk, but if you don't like the risk, it makes it less fun, but it's certainly the case that your, your payoffs will depend on things which you don't know, okay? And so they could be this, they could be that. And at the moment, just we're going to boil those payoffs down to a single number, but it's important to start with the idea, under games where there's uncertainty, you don't know what your payoffs are going to be. They could be lots of different things, depending on what could happen in the game. In this case, there are lots of different things according to the draw of the, of the, of the card. Okay, um, now, let me just put this minus one here. Here are two contingent payoffs. One is losing two or, um, or gaining two. That's what would happen if you would meet. And this one is losing minus one for sure. Okay, it's still a contingency. Like you lose a dollar if it's a club, you lose a dollar for a spade, because that's what's going to happen if you if you if you pass at this stage after the red player uh, has come in. But the idea is now we're going to express our payoffs by pairs of numbers. Okay, in this game, and then we're going to reduce those pairs of numbers to a single number, and we're going to do that through a kind of a process of averaging out either these numbers or some other things that take account of your risk preferences. But we're not going to do that today because that's too complicated and we're not even going to try and draw the, the payoff table. So uh, I will see you in about three weeks um, and I will have the exams probably by, uh, I, I'm hoping Thursday next week, okay? Uh, so it should be about two weeks. I'll send an email around and I'll post some, uh, some model answers and, and the, the grades for you.